So when it came to the levels, the characters are pretty much chibi style and mostly focus on dark colors. So it was highly important for us to figure out the color palette that we are going to use for the levels. And both of the levels use very strong colors, very strong uh, background schemes and a lot, lot of parallax elements. So that we can easily highlight the characters more and give it more depth and feel. And we also needed to introduce a lot of uh, side assets to be placed and set design because it's a fighting game and we wanted to use all these elements and some sort of animations and different use the monsters around to give the player a proper feedback. So I'll pass it on to Javier so he can talk about our main mechanic which is uh, obviously fighting but we have another uh, mechanic where you control the hands of the player. 
Yeah, we did. Uh, we want to give the player a little bit more of control of what they were going to do, and we didn't want to go with the conventional thing of just pressing a button and doing an attack. We want to give the player the chance to, like, as you see, depending on which uh, or where the hand is located, he would uh, trigger a certain attack animation. Yeah, that's uh, basically how it works. All right, so. Let's get down to business. Uh, what is the score? Like 72? <laughs> and I think Thomas got those two, uh, two wins because Evo wasn't looking, right? <laughs> this is time to prove that you can actually beat him. Oh, right? As it, his TA is where Doc let him win. <laughs> <laughs> That's what all the TAs say. Like. <laughs> right? So let's have. Yeah, let's get this started. Yep, so we have Evil playing as the witch. <laughs> I don't know why, but Evil is not using his favorite mechanic. Oh. Wow, looks like it's one nothing. He rage quit already. Evil is not losing his first match. Evil, don't forget your favorite mechanic. Dodge it. Forget the dodge mechanic. Let's give it another go. Let's let's do best out of three. One more. Other match. So this is our second level. B. So in order to dodge, you face the character. Sorry, you face away from the character, and you'll have the ability to. Go right behind him and try to attack with a with a spell attack. Wow! Okay. Wow! Okay. Just saving it for now, huh? Couldn't do this earlier. Thank you guys. That is uh, Demon Rope. Please come upstairs and play the game. Try it. We'd love to get your feedback. Are there any questions? We don't need questions. I guess we're not doing questions. All right. Thanks, again, guys. So the question is, what are the different mechanics that the demons can do? Uh, you want to take this? Okay. Well, <laughs> I know it, I just want to get them involved. Um, so, obviously attack, they can dodge. Um, and, yeah, that's, we, we want it to be really fast-paced. So we didn't want to like implement like superpowers and all that. We were actually thinking about that at first, but uh, the main mechanics are dodging and using, uh, you know, like your directional, uh, yeah, using the directions to figure out where you want to attack, which direction you want to attack from, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yes. Um, why did you opt for like a pseudo Z depth as opposed to like a traditional two D fighter? Like you opted for Castle Crashers kind of stuff. Sorry, can you? Are we going for? A ca sorry, the question was. Uh, why did you opt for a pseudo Z depth? Uh, the ability to go up and down as opposed to mm -hmm. just 2D. Um, so the question was, why do we pick to go up and down instead of just like a, a, a typical 2D fighter where you go uh, left and right? Um, to be honest with you, we wanted to give the player the ability to be able to, you know, like traverse through the, through the level, not just simply move forward, dodge behind the enemy. We felt like it would be just too basic to do that. So we also want to get, give the ability so to, uh, for players to chase after each other in different directions so they can strategize better and maybe like if you're good enough because Javi keeps beating me uh, you can go behind and yeah just do your surprise attack does that answer your question? absolutely yeah. perfect and yeah thanks guys that's it for us thank you Demon Bro. Uh that was awesome I there was something wrong with my controller it's uh, probably cable, and it's, I don't know. Anyway. Um, <laughs> it's the light. Uh, anyway. Um, the next game. Uh, the
the next team actually did something really amazing uh, because we have all these 2D games and 2D has obvious limitations and one of those uh, limitations is obviously uh, the lighting that's very easy in 3D but in 2D it's not at all and this is actually the first time that I've seen a team manage to pull off the uh, using Unity lighting on their 2D sprites. Uh, please welcome Crimson Grit. this project. Um, well, this is Crimson Grid. Um, well, before coming here to DFS, I hadn't had anything to do with programming visually, so this was really an adventure that I actually want to thank Ivo for helping me out and realize how to do all those things. And it was like very interesting to do the, well, uh, I honestly don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a lot of things that had to be worked on. And, uh, it's been an experience, honestly. I don't think that I could have gotten a better team to learn so much and to realize so many things. And this one experience is just so fun. Uh, I'm going to let you with the center. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi everybody, I'm Duncan Crawford. I am one of the level designers as well as the mechanical designer for the game. Uh, so Crimson Grip is a real last play. Uh, uh, we've got three main mechanics basically. We have the slash, we have the dash, and we have the parry mechanic, which we'll go into a little bit. So I'll just go through and kick this guy's butt. Thank you very much. Uh, the main design influences for our game were primarily Metal Slug in addition to the Mega Man Zero series. Uh, we did enjoy the Metal Slug series, but we found that having a gun weapon kind of removes a lot of the precision of the gameplay, whereas you can just kind of shoot and spray to god your bullets, just cut them all down. So we opted to go for more of a melee type weapon, so to enforce more of a... Uh, requiring more precision and thought from the player. Um, we also designed the fact that, you know, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to guess at enemies. So we uh, introduced a parry mechanic, which Alan will show here hopefully in a second. Oh, I'm sure he'll get it sometime. But uh, yeah, designing it was a lot of fun. A little bit of uh, difficulty to tweak and variables, but it was all in all a great learning experience. And I'm looking forward to the next game I'm going to design. And now I'll hand it over to our secondary level designer. Uh, just to talk about a little bit uh, about the level design process. Uh, we basically had to design the level basically based around the player's mechanics, which is uh, dash, uh, jump, and slash. So with enemy placement, we wanted to have like three uh, levels of versatility. So we have like your basic building with uh, sharpshooters. Uh, so as the player progresses through the game, uh, we wanted to introduce uh, new enemies. Uh, so basically, you have a typical gunslinger that kind of just shoots in a line, uh, and a sniper on the rooftop. So, uh, since the gameplay is a little bit faster than your typical 2D side scroller, uh, we wanted the player to be super on their toes and uh, be really aware of their surroundings uh, while dashing and slashing uh, all your foes uh, in your way. Uh, so the level design was just uh, basically about uh, having three uh, levels of uh, height as well as really good enemy placement. Uh, so uh, with that being said, I'll pass it on to our artist. Well, for the art, um, it's a mix of Western and Japanese, as you can see. Um, well, the interesting thing is that uh, everything is made from 3D molds and then rendered in, with, with a chalice uh, shader and uh, also with a material shader, I mean, normal map shader. So you have two sprites for each frame. Um, with Unity, you can use normal map just as you use in 3D. So we use that with dynamic lighting, and you can move the lights around. And it looks like it was 3D, but it's actually a 2D sprite, and it's really cool. And I learned like yesterday 
that apparently optimization is a thing you should like think about from the beginning is really important. And that will make that mistake again. Um, Olin? Uh, we'll pass it off to our project manager. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, once again, well, thank you everyone for listening, this, is, this has been our project. Uh, sadly, we, don't, we are not that good at our own game and we weren't able to reflect a weapon, a bullet in the meantime. It's a hard game, <laughs> completely intended. Yeah. Uh, so we invite you to go upstairs and actually have the experience and thank you very much. struggle this morning, but I'm, I'm super happy that you guys pulled it off. Really awesome job with that, guys, so congrats. Um, so this group, this, this class actually had, uh, had many firsts. It seemed that every, every group kind of wanted to do something original that hadn't been done before. Uh, so the, the, the lighting, as I mentioned before, uh, was one of them. But there's also this other, uh, the new group here, uh, that actually made the first strategy game uh, in 2D. And uh, that is a really awesome game. Uh, please welcome Rez Nove. Thank you very much, Evo. Uh, so the game that we created is Rez Nove, uh, which is a strategy game. And the way that we came to the idea to create a strategy game was Josh, our programmer, or one of the programmers on the team, he actually posed the question of what can be a fun 2D game that's not a platformer. So we had some thoughts about that, uh, and that's how we came to the point of a lot. Some of us on the game on the team have played games like Fire Emblem and Advance Wars, and we thought that's a really fun game. But we don't want to make something that's a clone of those games. So we decided to take something that has that feel and turn it into a real-time strategy game that has a much more faster pace. But I'll hand it off to Josh so we can talk a little bit more about the mechanics and the program that went into it. Do you want to? Bring the game up. Oh yeah, <laughs> bring the game up too. Yeah. So uh, hi guys, I'm Josh Pell. I was the programmer on this project, and uh, you'll see more when we play. But basically, the game creates a grid for you to play on, and each team spawns with five units, and you can order your units around the grid, and they move, and then you can shoot with them. And the objective of the game is there are three capture points. For each capture point you hold, your score ticks up. First player to fill their score bar wins. Um, simple in concept, a little harder in execution. So first challenge we kind of ran into was how do you create a grid system and get units to move on it? And then from there, how do you get them to figure out where they're going? So we have roads, rivers, impassable terrain, that sort of thing. And getting the units to navigate them was actually really hard. I had to learn breadth first pathfinding, which is less fun than it sounds. And it was a lot of work, and I spent a lot of hours in Evo's office and probably owe him some, like, candy or something as a thank you. Beer. But, so, yeah. <laughs> Beer. Shh, we're on stream. Um, no, so, yeah, so you select your units, and you can order them around, and they will navigate around obstacles, and you can order them to shoot each other. And one of the kind of unintentional things that came out of it was a lot of strategy, because... We made it so units can overlap each other because there were a lot of choke points and it led to unbalanced gameplay otherwise. And then Evo started stacking all of his units into one column and moving them all at once to make a human shield, and it was really fun. And so I'm gonna pass it off to Joel, who is our level designer. Hi to everyone, I'm Joel, the level designer of this project. And surely the most challenging thing of this game was the size of the map. As you can see, the map is not very big because we wanted to go for a fast-paced couch game, so a game where two people can actually play together on the same screen. At the beginning, we started to think about having two different screens, but then it was too difficult for networking and everything. When he heard about the idea, was like, okay, guys, don't do it. So we decided to do this. 
which is uh, it was still a challenge speaking about the level design because as you can see not now but before as you can <laughs> see before um, there are three choke points basically where the, you can move the units freely um, and I wanted to give to the players the opportunity to explore the map, but at the same time I want him to go for the targets. I didn't want the player to stay like waiting, defending a position. And this was also helped uh, by the heart, and now Trevor is going to talk about free flow of the heart. Hi everybody, my name is Trevor Beattie, I was the artist on this project. It was really enjoyable considering the way that we decided to divide up and do the art was that we would have JC to the UI and me with the uh, battling and everything you see here in the gameplay. It was really enjoyable just to have that to focus on. It allowed me to really go for something that I always wanted to do as a child. Is uh, I really loved the Fire Emblem series. So the first game I played was uh, Fire Emblem for the GBA. One of the cool things about that game is that they use a very minimal color palette. So while going into this game, I managed to lock down the color palette that I had to only 42 colors. So the entire game you'll not see no more than 42 different individual colors on the screen, which is something I'm a little bit proud of. Oh, very proud, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was really enjoyable researching into how Romans did their combat. It's a little bit different from what you're used to considering the fact they have rocket launchers, but it was really enjoyable to figure out everything else about what they did, and it really inspired me to go out and do some more things with the design. All right, well, that's not for me. I'll pass off to JC, our programmer and UI artist. Hi everyone, I'm um, JC Programmer in UI. Um, it, this project was really fun and the fact that we're using um, ancient Rome um, and set it to like a new, a new setting, futuristic Rome. And doing the UI is, um, was really a fun experience and programming as well. But Doing those, it, um, it was a really hard a pro process, but um, in the end, I managed to get through it. And yeah, I'm gonna pass it to Kai. All right, guys, so this is Resmo Bay. Uh, we'll put a lot of hard work into it. I appreciate my team. They did a lot of hard work as well. Uh, and this is what we finished. I see a hand somewhere back there. Yeah. Uh, why did you guys decide to go with a uh, capture the point system rather than, say, a deathmatch or a capture the flag system? Sure. Uh, the reason we went for a capture the flag system, a capture the point system. For, so first off, the question was, why did you go for a capture the point system rather than deathmatch or a more traditional capture the flag? Uh, one of the reasons was because the map was so small, we opted away from deathmatch because with only five units per player, it became very easy to kill them off and then the games ended in like 15, 20 seconds. Uh, the other thing was originally when we had built the game, the units operated on a much longer cooldown. So you could order a unit and then it would have to wait four seconds before it could act again. And we played it and we played test and we realized it just wasn't nearly as fun and the chaos added to the enjoyment. So by forcing the players to meet in the middle and fight over things, we could simulate that chaos and force it. Okay, thank you for being here, and then we can go upstairs and play the game if you want. See you. Um, so, during my classes, I always like to keep things a little bit happy, and I like to make make fun classes with fun topics and not too much violence uh, in the games. Um, but for some reason, for some reason, uh, many many of the games uh, they they go to the darker side and they want to do something bloody, and uh, and that's also in the next game where you're uh, you're somewhere in the underworld and you're fighting demons. Uh, and it's uh, it's pretty scary. Um, please welcome Blood Mage. Hey everybody, we are Team Blood Mage. Uh, I'm Ashani, the project manager. 
I'm Michael, I'm the artist. I'm Timo, I'm the programmer. I'm Filippo, level designer. Uh, and I'm Tomer, the programmer. So, uh, while we wait to open it up, in Blood Mage you play as a Blood Mage escaping from hell who has to fight her way out of uh, hell and get to the surface by uh, using three main mechanics, melee, ranged, and teleportation, and Flippo will explain a bit more about that. So let's go with the first level. So we see we have, uh, as Shai introduced, the Blood Mage, the first mechanic that we recently introduced is a range attack. So the range attack deals damage to the enemy, but also deals damage to the card itself. We have also a melee attack as a secondary mechanic, but the core feature is, of course, teleportation. So, yeah, this is kind of a big fail, but... <laughs> uh, so, the enemy gets wounded, and the player can uh, teleport from one wounded enemy to another. So, use them as a portal to skip through certain parts of the level, and so we could say the puzzle that is offered, and avoid the biggest challenge and finish the level as fast as possible. So we've made 12 levels and we have a progression through the game. Uh, we start in hell and we go through a cave and then we escape into the surface. Uh, for example, now we get introduced uh, doors uh, that will uh, block the path of the player. We have at this point lever that needs to be reached and uh, pulled to open the door. So we see now the player hit uh, damage that's next to the door, reach the level and activate it. Did I activate it? Yeah, activate the level and teleport from one wooden enemy to the other one to avoid all the obstacles that are in the middle. So, yeah, you want to try again? <laughs> yeah. So, we also have three, four different types of, four, three different types of enemy. So, smaller demons that are faster and deals not that much damage and they are used mainly to as an entrance and exit for uh, the teleportation bigger demons that are tougher to fight and skeletons that are static and are used kind of as a damaging walls and obstacles to overcome so michael do you want to go through the art okay so for the art this was actually uh kind of my first foray into uh doing 2d art i generally do more 3D type things, so uh, I went for uh, a kind of a pixel art style um, and uh, put a lot of time into uh, character animations and uh, like level level backgrounds, things things like that. Um, I feel like uh, the larger demon has uh, over uh, 60 frames of animation, so it was quite a challenge for us to get everything implemented. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I feel like, uh, pretty happy with the results and, uh, a huge part, a huge part of, the, of the game that we use to make all the levels and do a quick iteration and actually for making the level we used a tile system and Tim could talk about it. Yeah, so in terms of programming I wanted to say a few words about the features that we are pretty proud of. The first one is the system we constructed for getting Filippo's ideas from his head and implementing them into Unity and into the game. And the system that each level is designed just through two simple text files, uh, that allows Filippo to make 12 levels instead of three that we planned at first. And the second one is our teleportation mechanic that looks and plays nice. And big shout out to Ivo and Thomas for helping us fixing all the bugs that came up with, with the mechanic. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to come play all 12 levels, we'll be upstairs. And yeah, thank you. to plan out their movements so they could see like which areas were more challenging, where the lever was in relation to the doors, and kind of plan out their teleportation route. 
So if you had an enemy by the door, you would try and jump up, damage it so that you could later teleport to it, versus just hacking and slashing your way through, which would we assumed would uh, be what would happen if you could just only see uh, one screen at a time. That's it. Black Mage. Thank you. Awesome. So, I, I like to think that I'm pretty good at all these games, but um, as, as you've seen, you know, sometimes I struggle. I, uh, I actually don't play many games, usually, so uh, yeah, that's, that's sometimes embarrassing. Um, but the next team, actually, they, they found a solution for that, because in their game, when you die, you just continue as a spirit. Please welcome Shamania. Christian is the project manager, so let will introduce us. Yeah, so as I said, uh, we're Kruja Vanelvanak. Uh, we made this game called Shemania. Uh, it's going to open up here in just a few seconds. Uh, and you'll see our title screen right here. Uh, the thing in the middle is the character. He's the uh, main guy you're going to be playing. Uh, the music's kind of spooky, but it's actually a really lighthearted game. Uh, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, so here's our guy. He's got a few mechanics he can do. Uh, he can jump, uh, he can shoot a projectile, he can summon a hand that will help him move objects in the environment. Uh, this here. Uh, he has a ledge grab mechanic. The ledge grab was actually really hard to code and program. Uh, we had to do quite a few iterations of that uh, to go through it. Uh, and I'm going to take over to Daniel, who is the level designer, and he's going to tell you a bit about why we did what we did. Hey guys, um, so I was the level designer and also the uh, audio designer for this. So this is a bit of a difficult um, project that we managed here in terms of level design because uh, as we're about to see in a second here, um, there's actually two worlds superimposed off of each other. So... <laughs> you want to do the honors there, Zach? Oh no, okay. So uh, there are two, uh, a real world and a spirit world. Um, and in order to progress in some of these levels, like we're going to have to do here, uh, you actually need to go off and uh, do this. this. <laughs> there we go. And uh, now we're in the spirit world. Um, and we can see some things that weren't there before, some uh, floating platforms. So uh, this made the design for the levels uh, really tricky, actually, because we needed to keep everything kind of within the frame and always visible so that's not confusing for the player. So. Uh, a lot of the way that I went about the level design is keeping things very tight packed. Um, when I was designing, I did lots of little puzzles and just kind of iterated on them and uh, made sure that everything was close together and not kind of sprawled out across the map. Um, in terms of, oh, there's a resurrection there. Um, so, and then just back into the action. Um, in terms of dealing with the puzzles, um, I mainly just kind of went about uh, giving myself a problem to solve and going, can I actually reverse engineer this and then actually come up with a solution? Um, and that's mainly the way I went about that. So um, I'm just going to pass it up to uh, Kevin here, who's going to talk a little about the environmental art, which there's a lot of. All right, so I'm Kevin, and I am one of the artists on the team. Uh, basically, from the get-go, Calvin and I, we really wanted to have pixel art. So everything you see there is done in pixels. Um, we also wanted to have two worlds that we could play around with. So having the spiritual world really gave us freedom to uh, do a lot of work that we could, and we, we were just able to keep pumping out assets, and it's, it was a lot of fun. Um, Calvin did a lot of the uh, uh, character art, and I did a lot of the environment art. And I'll pass it off to Calvin so we can uh, talk about his characters. Well, we all got the idea that we wanted extra pixels for the reminding of the old game, so 95% of the, uh, the game is actually pixel. We 
didn't have too much experience with actually 2D. So we actually gone on learning and learning throughout the classes. So this is actually our final actually abilities to 2D. We play a lot along with the color palette. It was kind of uh, hard to identify the character at, at one point. So thanks to the environment lighting of lighting and the colors we used, it came out with this. We wanted to actually cut the main character be more notice more noticeable and more in the environment. So we pass it on to Zach, the coder. So I did the programming. Um, one of the funnest, more addicting features is just a simple ledge grab, where you jump up and sort of hang on the edge. Uh, yeah, that's also really fun to watch. So we did a lot of animation coding, uh, but the ledge grab actually was a sort of surprise feature that we didn't consider a main mechanic, but we learned that things like that can sort of sneak up on you and take a lot of time to make work right. Um, things like the, the crushing death and just a lot of problem solving to, to make things work the way we want to be too. Um, as far as my personal design pillars, we're kind of, uh, to avoid like cognitive dissonance, just sort of like 1980s Mario style things. I mean games where you're, uh, uh, there's like floating geometry. Uh, so we, we have everything supported either on pillars or once you die and you're in the spirit world, things can float because you've got more leeway there, logically. Uh, the other thing was to make... <laughs> to make a platformer that's fun to play for people who don't like platformers, uh, which I don't normally, but this was actually pretty fun to do and, and uh, it's amusing. So I think we succeeded there. And uh, here we are. We'll get just to the end of the level momentarily. Uh, here, uh, why don't we actually talk a little bit while we're getting to the end here about uh, kind of how we came about the uh, idea for Shimaya. Um When we were developing this, uh, one of the things that came up in games that we enjoyed was uh, meaningful death. So basically just death that doesn't actually just end the game. Which is kind of what we uh, went about for this game. We can end that level there, it's fine. And to answer your question in. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question in advance, if you die in the spirit world, you just restart at the last checkpoint. So, yeah. This is just a presentation build. Uh, come on upstairs and play more of our levels. We'd love to have you up there. Any questions? Right in the back. I think I see a hand. Why did you use uh, IP for the last piece of music at the end? That belongs to somebody else. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Use IP? Come on. Uh, it seems like somebody else is in the property. It might be. This <laughs> 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 was the, uh, yeah, the, the main music was um, Newgrounds? Yeah, Newgrounds. Oh, it was Newgrounds. Yeah. It may have been a 3 a.m. in the morning decision. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. That's your money. Amazing. Okay. Um, five amazing teams so far. One more amazing team to go. Um, like I said, many firsts. Uh, this, this team actually really wanted to push that, that limitation of the 2D project. They said like, well, you say 2D, what does that mean? Is that, what are the real restrictions, you know? Like, I said, well, you know, it's just not 3D, that's pretty much it. Um, which may have not been a great description, but uh, they really wanted to make uh, a, a puzzle game though where you can walk around in a, basically a 3D world and uh, they had to be creative technically to actually keep that 2D and they are the first team that ever made 
a 2D isometric puzzle game. Don't go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and please, uh, please welcome Captura. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, everyone, so this is Captura, and it's a 2D isometric game. I think like when we started like making the game, we fumbled around like a mechanic. We said like, yeah, let's, let's do it this mechanic. But I really wanted to show something with that mechanic, and we're not sure what, but we, we <laughs> wanted to do something cool. So we said, yeah, why not we use like a female protagonist, and we show like through this mechanics, uh, her will. And it was like her will to protect something that's like good for her, that's like close to her, like it's precious to her. And we came like around with this idea of making her protect a baby and change the world around her to save this baby. It's like super trippy, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I'm gonna pass to a programmer who was the Duarte in this group. Hello everyone. I was the Duarte in this group. Uh, Bruno just skipped a level. Um, so basically, our main mechanic to show uh, the story that we wanted to show is to capture objects in the game world and place them somewhere else. So in that way, the mother that is called Pierit, by the way, uh, she sort of tries to imagine a world where she could be uh, together and healthy with her baby because they're both sick. So. Basically, the most technically challenging thing about this project was doing isometric. So, any of the 44s here, don't do it. It's not worth it. But it looks super good. These are actually. Yeah, it's kind of worth it. Yeah, kind of worth it. Uh, these are pretty much 3D cubes with a sprite rendered on top of them. And so, I actually built a tool where you can build the levels with cubes, just like like blank cubes, and then when you press play, they actually up, like alter it and render the sprite instead of the cube, so I switch out the art. Uh, and I'll pass it on to Lucas, who did all this freaking amazing art. Hello. Hello everyone, I'm Lucas, I'm the artist in the group. Um, when we had uh, come up with this mechanic about that you can capture things and put them back in the world to solve puzzles, I we were thinking about what camera angle that would like work for this. And uh, one night I was browsing online and I saw this really cool drawing, uh, isometric drawing. And the next day I pitched the group like, I think we should make this isometric because it looks really good and I think it would work really well with the mechanic. Everyone thought I was insane, <laughs> and um, but we went for it, and um, we really pushed ourselves, and um, it turned out real well, both for gameplay and art-wise, I think. Another major thing um, is the color palette for the three different levels. The first level, we wanted to have kind of dark and rainy, um, and then we wanted to build up some kind of progression through the game. And uh, to do that, we used uh, color correction, which, which was uh, kind of cool, uh, very very helpful. So we had like a little texture fill, uh, texture you plug into the game, and the camera is rendering different colors. And uh, I'm gonna pass on to Stuart to talk about the level design. Hey guys, so uh, I worked on the levels in this game uh, along with Bruno as well. He did a lot of the work, so thanks, Bruno. Um, puzzles are hard. 
Never build puzzles. Um, we ended up, because of all the different elements that we have, we ended up having to make the entire game pretty much a tutorial. So each level um, introduces a new mechanic just because we couldn't front load them all. Like we had to introduce them slowly. And um, so the level design was actually made a lot easier by Duarte's absolutely amazing level design tools, like the cube sprite black magic that he was talking about earlier. Like it's still mesmerized by that, it's, it's insane. But uh, yeah, Bruno, uh, our project manager, is gonna finish up the presentation for us. Uh, so yeah, this capture in, I think like looking back that we're like designing around this feeling that was, it's harder to, for you like to complete the levels with the baby, but we would never like go and tell that to the player because we don't have like text, we don't have like, just like sounds and music and art. And we never say, hey man, your baby's there, your baby's in the rain, go grab your baby. But it's like a pain in the ass to finish the levels with the baby. <laughs> so we designed another feeling about like forgetting the baby, you know, like you're gonna forget your baby and then you're gonna get to the end and maybe you have like a different ending if you go like through the whole game with the baby. We're gonna show you guys how the game ends when you finish the game the game without a baby. So if you can do it, please. We've been like skipping through levels so we can show like the mechanics, so you get like lots of view slots and stuff like to do. Yeah, we saw the statues they showed them. So you can capture like almost everything that's in the world. And that's gonna be the end the ending of the game if you finish without your baby or if you're like a terrible mom. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I got, yeah, I got to 